Welcome friends, it's g -Sat from Butterfly Garden. The story we're going to read today is called Child of the Civil Rights Movement, written by Paula Young Shelton and illustrated by Raul Colon. Going home. Mama was from Alabama. Daddy was from Louisiana, the Deep South. They had been called bad names treated badly, told, you can't do that, just because of the color of their skin. They grew up with Jim Crow, laws that said black people had to sit in the back of the bus, the last car of the train, the balcony of the movie theater, laws that said black people couldn't vote. I was born in New York, where there was no Jim Crow. But one day, when Mama and Daddy were watching the news, they saw something called the Freedom Riders black and white students riding buses together from north to south to protest the bad laws. They watched as racists pulled the students from their seats and set the buses on fire. We have to go help, my father exclaimed. We have to go home, my mother declared. So mommy and daddy packed up their three little girls, Andrea, Lisa, and me, and went back to Georgia, back to Jim Crow, where whites could but blacks could not. Back to the heart of the civil rights movement. My first protest. In our new home in Atlanta, Jim Crow was everywhere. At first, I thought Jim Crow was a big black crow that squawked whenever a black person tried to get a good seat. Caw, caw, you just can't sit there. But really, he was a white man who lived long ago. He painted his face black and made fun of African Americans. He didn't sound very nice to me. I guess that's why they named the laws after him, because they weren't very nice either. Despite Jim Crow, a few restaurants had opened where blacks and whites could eat together. One Sunday, Mama and Daddy decided to see how far things had really come. So after church, we went to have brunch at the brand new Holiday Inn restaurant. We stepped into the fancy lobby with chandeliers hanging from the ceiling, and we asked for a table, but they wouldn't let us in. We looked at all the empty tables with white tablecloths and the few white faces that stared at us in horror. All we wanted was to sit down and eat. I was so hungry that I started crying, but they wouldn't let us in. My baby's hungry, Mama said, while I kept crying louder and louder. Mama and Daddy didn't try to stop me. They simply sat down and let me cry, and did I ever. I screamed at the top of my lungs my very first protest, my own little sit-in, but they still wouldn't let us in. Uncle Martin. Uncle Martin had a big, broad smile and eyes that twinkled. Come here, girl, he'd say, whenever our family would meet at one of the only pools for African Americans in Atlanta, the Ollie Street YMCA. Are you ready to get in the water and teach me how to swim? Run! I would run as fast as my skinny legs could carry me, run and leap, leap into his wide open arms and fly, fly as he threw me high into the air. No, I would scream and laugh, my arms clasped tightly around his neck as he pretended to throw me in. But Uncle Martin wasn't really my uncle, not by blood anyway. We were close because our fathers worked together, close because our mothers worried together, close because we all struggled together, close because we were brought together for a common goal, a common good. We were one family, the family of the American Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Family. Like all families, we'd have dinner together, and since there were so few restaurants that served African Americans, we'd often eat at friends' houses. We might walk around the corner to our Uncle Ralph and Aunt Juanita's, or go to Uncle Martin and Aunt Coretta's, or everyone would come to our house. One night, it was our turn to host. I sat under the kitchen table watching and listening, watching the folks in the dining room, listening to the booming voices, angry sometimes. They were talking about Selma, Alabama, where, as in most cities in the South, blacks had been denied the right to vote. They were organizing a huge march to protest from Selma to Montgomery. They had already marched twice before, twice before they'd been beaten back. With everyone trying to talk at once, 
I thought they sounded just like instruments tuning up for concert. Blackwell, the professor, was like a trombone, so smooth, clearly presenting the facts. Hosea ambled around the table in his overalls, tooting like a tuba. I was in Selma last night, and we've got to go back. Let's wait, Daddy said, the mellow saxophone of reason. I flinched when Big Orange stood up, his huge frame towering above everyone else. That ain't right, Andy, he boomed like a bass drum. We've got to go help these folks now. Uncle Raph agreed, his voice rising melodically above the horns and drum like a violin. Then Aunt Dorothy's sweet soprano joined in. We've got to get the young people involved, she sang. If they can go to Vietnam to fight, they can fight at home. Mama's flute chimed in from the kitchen, reminding the men that the women would be the key to any march's success. Meanwhile, Uncle Martin sat silent and listened to the orchestra play. Uncle Martin loved the music of his friends and knew that each instrument needed to be heard, but he also knew that in the end, they must come together like a symphony as one. Paula, baby, Mama said, set the table. I slipped out from the, my hiding place, grabbed the napkins and forks, and bounced into the dining room, my nightgown fluttering behind me. The discussion continued as passionately as before, but as I set each place, the person seated paused, looked at me, and smiled, patted my head, or gave me a gentle hug. Dinner's ready, Mama called, carrying a large dish of macaroni and cheese. Let me help you, Jean, Aunt Dorothy volunteered and went to get the bowl of greens and a pitcher of sweet tea. In the kitchen, Andrea grabbed the big chicken and marched in first, as always. Lisa came next, carrying a big, beautiful salad, and I got the basket of corn cornbread. Sometime later, when everyone was done, there were hugs and kisses, and I'm so full I can walk, and raving about the macaroni and cheese, which seemed to come from a magic pot that filled up every time you scooped some of the creamy casserole onto a plate. No matter how many people came to dinner, there was always enough to go around, enough to strengthen, enough to comfort the family of the Civil Rights Movement. Selma to Montgomery. Daddy was away a lot. Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, Georgia, while Mama stayed home to care for us. He was always marching, organizing, registering voters, protesting unfair laws, teaching nonviolence, Sometimes he was beaten. Sometimes he went to jail for breaking the Jim Crow laws that said blacks and whites couldn't eat together or go to school together or even drink from the same water fountain. Sometimes he went to jail just for marching. But when Daddy was getting ready to march to Montgomery, Mama said, I'm marching too. So they packed up their three little girls and we headed to Selma. We gathered at Brown Chapel AME Church the next morning with thousands of others. I looked around and saw so many different kinds of people, black and white, young and old, rich and poor. There were Jewish rabbis, Catholic priests, and lots and lots of Baptist ministers. There was even a man with one leg who everyone called Sunshine. There were people from the South and people from the North. One group had come all the way from Hawaii and they handed out blaze to the leaders Excitement flashed through the air like lightning. Then Uncle Martin linked arms with a priest and extended his hand to Aunt Coretta as if to ask her to dance, and the march was on. Since I was only four years old, I could walk for just a little while. Mama carried me until she got tired, and then I got passed from aunt to uncle to aunt. Lisa was eight, still small enough to ride on Daddy's shoulders as he jogged up and down the long line of marchers shouting at us to pick up the pace or starting a song to keep our spirits high. He ran up and down that long line so many times, he said he marched from Selma to Montgomery 10 times that week. Andrea was 10 years old and she marched proudly that day. Do you want to ride, Mama asked, offering to put her in one of the cars that followed behind for old folks and young folks and just plain tired folks? No, I want to march, she answered firmly. That night I fell asleep in Mama's arms. When I woke up, I was at my grandparents' house, not far from Selma. Andrea, Lisa, and I spent the rest of the week there while Mama and Daddy continued on. 
It would take four days to march the 50 miles from Selma to Montgomery. The National Guard escorting the peaceful protesters the whole way to keep them safe. All over the country, people watched on TV as the group marched triumphantly into Montgomery. President Johnson saw it too. The Voting Act of 1965. Then, one joyous evening, the 6th of August, 1965, my family sat around our small black and white television set. Uncle Martin stood over the shoulder of President Johnson and watched him sign the bill that would make sure all people, black and white, could vote and no one could stop them. Curled up on Mama's lap, I thought about our march while pictures flashed across the screen. Andrea and Lisa shouted at the TV, pointing out folks we knew and the places we'd been. We talked about the singing, the praying, the friends and the family, even the tired feet. It made me glow with pride to know that I had played one small part. But even then, I also knew that we'd won just one battle and there were many more to come. And one day, when Mama and Daddy were too tired to march, too weary to carry us on their shoulders, too exhausted to fight another battle, the baton would pass to us and we would march on, children of the Civil Rights Movement. Thank you for joining us. Please support us by subscribing to our channel.